Good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Bob Keiter, uh, director of the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and Environment at uh, the University of Utah, S.J. Quinney College of Law. Uh, we're very pleased to have you join us uh, today uh, for uh, one of our series of noon uh, green bag uh, presentations. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to uh, hearing from Professor Natalie Cook uh, on uh, her book, uh, Arid Empires, The Entangled Fates of Arizona and Arabia. Um, let me start, uh, though, uh, with our customary uh, native uh, lands acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is a traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and outreach activities. A couple of uh, short announcements, if I can, uh, here at the uh, outset. Uh, the Stegner Center has uh, additional uh, noon hour events uh, between now and the end of the uh, semester uh, here at the law school. On uh, Thursday, April 6th, uh, we will host uh, Professor Andrew Gulliford uh, from uh, Fort Lewis uh, College. He's a professor of history and environmental studies who will be speaking about his new book, uh, Bears Ears, Landscape of Refuge and Resistance. On Tuesday, April 11th, uh, Ann Palmer uh, will be addressing uh, a topic of uh, corresponding with the young uh, Wallace uh, Stegner. Uh, Anne was founding director of the University of Utah's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute and currently directs the Aspen Rising Presidential Fellowship uh, at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford uh, University, uh, where I believe uh, she uh, located some of these uh, early letters of Wallace uh, Stegner. And then finally, on uh, Wednesday, April 12th, uh, we will uh, show uh, one of the early uh, showings uh, of a new uh, film, uh, Stuart Udall, The Politics of Beauty, uh, and we will have with us the uh, director uh, of that uh, film, uh, and that's uh, John uh, DeGroff. Uh, today, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we will hear from Professor Natalie Cook uh, addressing uh, her book, Arid Empires, The Entangled Fates of Arizona and Arabia, a uh, topic of uh, interest to us here in Utah, given the similar aridity of our uh, state uh, with uh, both that uh, the state uh, and uh, the nation here. Uh, professor uh, Cook is uh, a professor uh, in the Department of Geography and the Environment at Syracuse uh, University. Uh, so she's uh, not uh, unaccustomed to the weather that we've experienced uh, today. Uh, she's a political uh, geography. Uh, she specializes in uh, the Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula region, uh, where she's worked uh, for the last uh, 10 plus uh, years. Uh, we'll have uh, an opportunity for questions uh, following uh, her presentation. We'll make use of the Slido device, uh, and uh, you can uh, use your uh, phone and follow the instructions uh, on uh, the screen. I should also note uh, that the Stegner Center is joined uh, by the King's English Bookshop uh, to co-sponsor today's uh, reading uh, and presentation. Uh, they have copies of Professor Cook's book uh, outside uh, the auditorium. She would be happy to sign copies afterwards, and uh, the book is also available on the King's English uh, Bookstore's uh, website. So with that, uh, let me welcome uh, Professor Cook, and we very much look forward to hearing about the arid empires. Thank you for joining us. Right. 
Thank you for uh, that generous introduction and the invitation to be here, as, as well as those who are here in person uh, for braving it through the snow. As, uh, as you just heard, I'm familiar with these, these large snowstorms and understand how much shoveling that can involve. Um, so again, yes, thank you. And it's really, really quite a pleasure to be here. As I was just telling some of your colleagues, I spent much of the pandemic in uh, St. George and really had, had the chance to think through many of these questions here in Utah uh, and indeed to, to think through some of the final, um, the, the final work of this project came, came for me uh, in, in that time uh, in Utah. The piece of this story, though, that actually got me started on this book project was hearing about this uh, farm deal in Arizona uh, that led to the Saudi Arabian dairy company uh, Al Marai acquiring a, a very large tract of land in, in Arizona just outside of Phoenix where they were growing alfalfa which was then being shipped back to Saudi Arabia uh, to essentially feed the cows, feed the, feed the dairy industry that is actually quite strong uh, in, in Saudi Arabia. And in fact, Al Marai, this dairy company, is the largest dairy company in the Middle East. Uh, and it struck me at the time that I heard the news in 2015 that this was quite odd. I'm from Arizona. I'm from Tucson. Uh, and I sort of had thought to myself, we should know better than growing such water intensive crops uh, as alfalfa by today. Uh, and of course, we don't. <laughs> and this, uh, the, this farm continues and it has really in the last year exploded into something of a political issue in Arizona, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But when I first started uh, thinking about this farm, I was actually considering it more from my specialization as a Gulf and Arabian Peninsula studies scholar. Uh, and so I had seen pictures uh, of, of the, the way that this, this farm deal was being interpreted, uh, such as you can see here with this uh, image of the Saudi, a Saudi individual with his headscarf being sort of uh, taken over in a, in, a, in a way, or taking over the, the flag of Arizona. The, the, the star symbol there is, is the Arizona flag. And this question of how it was that Saudi Arabia and Arizona are entangled was something that, that sparked my interest, but I hadn't necessarily historicized yet. Uh, but when I started then looking at Al Marai, again, this is the, the Saudi dairy company, and seeing where their, their work was, uh, was taking them and where their land was, all of the sort of operations that they had. Uh, this is from their 2019 uh, annual report, although it looks the same for the 2021 version, which is the last one they've released. Uh, you have this, uh, th this image that they are present in, in, the, in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, but they also have land in the USA and Argentina. Uh, and so th this was something that I started looking at. But Al Marai is actually headquartered in Al Kharj, which is this town here uh, just, just outside of uh, Riyadh. And when I started to look into what this place was, uh, I also then started to uncover all sorts of historical documents in which it was clear that American farmers were being uh, were, were instrumental in setting up the far farming operations there uh, they, that began in the 1930s, but the US involvement really began end of the 1930s and into the 1940s. Uh, so some of, these, uh, the, some of these histories are things that got me quite interested. Uh, in, as I said, as a scholar of the, the Arabian Peninsula. And one other piece of that, the two bottom pictures here, these really evocative, beautiful images, uh, are from slides, uh, slide photographs that were in the archives at Syracuse University of one of my predecessors in the geography department, George Babcock Cressy. Uh, so Cressy is, uh, was, was a really, really famous geographer uh, in his day, and he had traveled all around the world, just took incredible photographs in so many places, and his image Images are in color because they are slide images. Uh, so it, it really struck me that he had been, he had visited Al Kharj, and these, these, uh, that this other image here was another image I had found in an article that he had written about Saudi water. Uh, and I started to get, started to wonder how it was that you know somebody who was a very different geographer than me uh, started also to have the same interests that I did in this particular place in Saudi Arabia. Uh, why was it that? 
that so many decades later, I too am standing in the dunes of, uh, of the Arabian Peninsula. And this kind of circularity of, of connections across space and time are really what I was interested in and thinking about this particular book project. Um, and beyond, uh, beyond just the way that deserts are often thought of comparatively, we, we, can, we can put them next to each other, uh, but my project started maybe with that idea, but quickly became a story of how are different deserts actually connected. And when I started to look at those active connections between these places, I started to realize this was also a, a history about colonialism and the colonization of, uh, of the United States, as well as the American imperial project in the Arabian Peninsula. So my effort in thinking across time and space was also then an effort to uh, try to make those histories of, uh, of empire visible. And the visibility piece is really quite important for me in, in this project. In large part, as I said, I'm from Tucson. Uh, and I had never really, when I was grown up, I was dressed up as a little cowgirl, right? Uh, and and uh, th this was a kind of fantasy of the Wild West that I had been raised with, going to Tombstone, going to uh, Old Tucson, and seeing where all these cowboy films were uh, were made in the desert in my backyard. But I hadn't really been taught to think about the role of, uh, yeah, of colonization in making that landscape what it was. Uh, there, there was kind of the sanitization of that colonial project and the seizing of this particular land, which is uh, pr predominantly uh, the land of the Tohono O'odham, the desert people. And so it was this kind of invisibility that I recognized in starting this project that it was that it was not just about my role as a geographer going to the Arabian Peninsula, where I specialize, but also as a geographer from Arizona who hadn't really been actively reflecting on these histories. Um, and so as I started to look into this uh, and, and try to historicize this project and how, uh, how it was that we started to see entanglements between Arizona and the Arabian Peninsula, uh, I really had to start with that question of how it was that uh, that that Arizona became part of the uh, U.S. state, and that effort was something that was very much tied to land and desert land in particular. Uh, so there were a lot of efforts to try to recruit settlers to come to to live in Arizona, which um, I think there's Utah has a different history, but there there's a lot of commonalities about the the challenges that early settlers had when dealing with the desert. Uh, the desert environment. And those challenges were primarily ones of cultivation and how do you sustain a livelihood in this place where you maybe don't necessarily have the, the skills uh, to, to address the, the arid landscape. And so these immigration uh, brochures, as you can see, just, just a few of these, there were lots of different ones that, that were trying to uh, promote the desert Southwest as a place where people could make it. They just needed the right skills in order to farm these lands and to take over these lands. Uh, so there were lots of efforts in, again, in these, uh, in these materials to teach people who would be, who would theoretically be settling, coming from the East Coast, that they can in fact make a fortune in agriculture if they come to uh, come to participate in this project of building Arizona uh, as a state. And just footnote to this, Arizona didn't become a state until 1912. Uh, so a lot of these materials are kind of in the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, where they were actively trying to, to achieve that statehood by achieving more settlers. And in these materials then, uh, such as this one, the Southern Arizona for the Settler uh, brochure, you also get a, a view on how it was that universities played an important role in this particular project. And in the case that, that, that I'm looking at, I'm focusing on the University of Arizona. Uh, because in, in this particular document, you have the agricultural extension services of the University of Arizona being advertised here uh, to, to convince people that Yes, you can farm here, and yes, if you do come, then you will have the uh, you will have the opportunity to work with specialists who can help you in your farming undertakings. Uh, so this was an important part of getting the University of Arizona started. Actually, um, the long longer story, but very brief. Uh, the university struggled to get a, get itself up and running to build Old Main, which is the the, the first building uh, of the of the campus 
campus uh, on, in the image there. And the, the, the regents essentially figured out that they could use the Hatch Act, which was a tack on to the moral land grant um, uh, legislation that allowed to, that helped support these land grant universities. The Hatch Act gave these universities extra money if they started an agricultural experiment station. So the regents figured out that they could use that money to get things up and running if they just started, uh, if they started an ag experiment station and that those funds were diverted to, to finish the construction of, uh, of Old Main and the, at the same time then getting getting the Ag Experiment Station up and running. So this this history in, in some ways I think is, is quite familiar for people, especially if you've read the, the, the really big important report from High Country News, the Land Grab Universities uh, report by Bobby Lee and Tristan Atone uh, that, that talk about the role of U.S. land grant universities and the appropriation of indigenous lands. And so that that history is is actually quite well known. Uh, the project that I was work, I was already working on this at the time that that report came out. But what struck me as, as somewhat different for the case of Arizona is that it was explicitly focused on uh, arid lands and desert expertise from really the beginning. Uh, so the question and the challenge for a lot of these early uh, early institution builders at the University of Arizona was how do you actually uh, create a university that can sell these these uh, these forms of knowledge of arid lands uh, expertise, and this is also especially challenging because they also didn't really know that much about the desert. <laughs> and so, uh, for the for the first people in charge of the agricultural experiment station, uh, they really thought to look immediately to uh, to the Middle East uh, for various reasons, including the fact that it was for for many of them familiar in, in a way because of the the sort of biblical stories that they knew and, and encountered the Middle East through, uh, but also just in in general through one particular industry, the date industry. Uh, we often well. I actually haven't met anybody yet who knows this history very well, uh, but in the 1800s, the United States had something of an obsession for dates. And by the end of the 1800s, we were importing millions and millions of tons of dates. And so when the first ag experiment station went to interview farmers around Arizona about what sort of crops they, they would want to try to promote uh, and, and that the university could help them develop, dates were, were very high on that list because it was seen as something that could be uh, very lucrative, but also we have this imagination, well, the boats were coming from Basra in, in Iraq and uh, Muscat in Oman. Uh, and so there, there was an awareness of, okay, if they're coming from these desert places in the Middle East, we can do that here too. Uh, so this is exactly what uh, the first agricultural experiment station folks were really getting behind, and this, this continued into the early 1900s. Uh, but in all of this, you have this idea of the desert being framed as a kind of laboratory for uh, these new farming enterprises and trying to set up, for example, uh, a, a domestic date industry. And they the way that they framed that was taking the knowledges and the ideas from the old world desert and transferring them to the new world desert. And in that, uh, again, you have you have this idea of the desert being a laboratory that that is actively promoted through lots of different projects at the University of Arizona, uh, including this Carnegie uh, Desert Laboratory, and a little bit later the Environmental Research Laboratory, and other sort of controlled agriculture, desert farming related projects. Uh, I won't talk too too much about this today because I want to get back to the to the Saudi uh, case, but I, just a, a bit of a footnote to the Environmental Research Laboratory because I think it helps us understand how we have some of these these long standing connections with the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, was the University of Arizona's first um, big project of the Environmental Research Laboratory was in Puerto Penasco in Mexico or Rocky Point, if if people know it uh, by the English version here. Uh, so it, at this particular site in the 1960s, the, uh, the Environmental Research Laboratory set up this big greenhouse desalination plant. It was a paired project and these sort of uh, the, these big uh, 
um, plastic plastic greenhouse uh, type operations, and they're the the two people from the University of Arizona who were behind this project, kind of showing their new technologies of desalinating seawater. This was something that Time Magazine actually ended up writing up, and this is the the, the image on the the bottom. There is uh, is that first Time Magazine article that was published in 1967 about this really modernist modern uh, technology that they were developing for farming in the desert. Uh, the, as it turns out, this particular article was read by the Sheikh of Abu Dhabi. At that point, Abu Dhabi was part of the Trucial States uh, under control of, of the British Empire. Uh, but during that time, in the late 60s, even when there was not necessarily a, a, an American presence in the Arabian Peninsula, the Sheikh had read this and asked the University of Arizona researchers to come set up a the same thing that they had built in Mexico to set that up in the Arabian Peninsula in um, in Abu Dhabi, and so uh, the the team from the ERL went. They they did set this up with the with the Mexican uh, model uh, and tried to build this up as this new big project in Abu Dhabi. Of course, we've got the the camels here and the uh, the, the displays of the first uh, the, the first people who were working on this particular project. So here you have the University of Arizona researchers figuring out that they could sell this project to the Arabian Peninsula and in. In fact, the number, the, the amount of money at that point in time, it was $3.1 million, which in 1967, that's quite a lot of money. Uh, it, was, it was something that they were very proud of, and they realized that they could actually build a sort of entrepreneurial project of selling the university's expertise and desert expertise in particular. Uh, so there were lots of reports about this particular, uh, th this particular project in, in Abu Dhabi that were circulating internationally, and uh, it was was something that these researchers were incredibly proud of, of sort of transforming this desert wasteland uh, in, into this space of cornucopia. So I will leave that case there, although I had to talk about it for hours as well. Uh, but I think the, the major point that I that, that I want to uh, get to is, is simply the fact that these researchers and other experts figure out that they can actually sell that arid lands expertise, uh, which they developed over many other projects that, that I haven't fully discussed here, uh, but selling that back to the Arabian Peninsula. And that becomes then a bridge for connecting these places. And this is a lesson, actually, that, that was known quite well, not just by the university researchers, but by a number of others. Uh, another key figure in this whole sort of story of building these early connections with the Arabian Peninsula around the desert uh, was, was this character, Carl S. Twitchell, who was a geologist. Uh, he actually had worked in Arizona, and he worked in the copper mines in the 19-teens. Uh, and then eventually he went and first traveled to the Arabian Peninsula and got to know uh, the, the Saudi the first Saudi king, King Ibn Saud, uh, and became a royal advisor to Ibn Saud. Uh, so this, uh, th this idea of the Arizona connection was something that he already understood from his communications with Ibn Saud uh, and, and saw that, uh, that, that the Saudis were very interested in the story that he was telling about, uh, about what Arizona farmers were able to achieve, the sort of miracle in the desert of bringing it under cultivation, et cetera and trying to convince the Saudis that this, this point of connection could be something uh, that, that would be quite valuable for them. Uh, so his his argument, and he goes on to, uh, to to do this kind of work in a lot of different spaces, as you can see from some of his articles in a more academic sense, um, but also just more generally working uh, together with various folks in the State Department, trying to convince them that one of the best ways the U.S. government can uh, enter Saudi Arabia and, and develop this relationship is by doing some of these more or less side projects for the king related to desert farming, to building up local agriculture. Um, these images are from Saudi Aramco, or Aram, now Saudi Aramco at that point in time, Aramco, the oil company, uh, who was also tasked with, uh, with, with this farming operations. But I'll get to that in a little bit. So for Carl Twitchell, he really saw this project of supporting the king's interest in the Al-Kharj farm. You'll remember 
Al Kharj, the same place where that Al Marai Dairy Company is headquartered. Uh, so Twitchell knew that Al Kharj was this really important place uh, for the king. The king had some farming operations there before the Americans really arrived and understood that this would be uh, an important, valuable place for the U.S. to to start to build a relationship. So you'll notice here the time that, that, that we are talking about is the 1940s during World War II. Uh, and there, there were a lot of things that the State Department wanted from a, a potential Saudi cooperation. Uh, so Twitchell was kind of operating within this frame. Uh, this, the US government in particular wanted airfields. They wanted to use airfields in, in Saudi Arabia, and the king was very resistant. Uh, so Twitchell essentially convinced the State Department that if they supported this farming work and the agriculture work, that that might get them the access that they were looking for in terms of the airfields, etc. Uh, so Twitchell sort of sells this project of the 1942 U.S. agriculture mission to Saudi Arabia, and this was State Department sponsored. Uh, and essentially, he just got money from State to send him on this whole sort of trajectory around Saudi Arabia. This um, map on the t on the the, the left-hand side of this uh, this image is all the different places that Twitchell and a few other colleagues from the U.S. Southwest uh, were, were sent to travel and evaluate Saudi water and natural resources. So with this, though, I think one of the fascinating things about the archival research I did for this project was re reading Carl Twitchell's diaries, uh, especially from the time he spent on this ag mission, which he often framed as we covered 10,000 miles, we went all over Saudi Arabia, but the vast majority of the time they actually spent in Al Kharj, which he referred to as home or his home base. Uh, and the whole project was essentially trying to set up this new farming operation in Al Kharj in particular. He didn't really care about anywhere else, and it was clear that the king didn't really care about anywhere else. It was just about setting up this royal farm in Al Kharj, and you can sort of see that for, from just a couple months into the excursion, he already has designed a whole uh, organizational chart for who's going to run that. Uh, and so the finance minister, one of the Saudi um, leaders who was really behind this project, with all these sort of American advisors coming into this. Uh, so the first ag um, mission was largely connected to, to getting this project up and running. But there were a few other knock-ons of, of uh, Twitchell's work in Al Kharj. Uh, not, we'll, we'll eventually get back to uh, the Saudi Dairy Company operating in Arizona now. But more immediately, uh, as a result of, of that mission, you had a team of Arizona farmers being sent to Saudi Arabia uh, to work at Al Kharj to help set that up, and that was State Department money, again, that was sponsoring uh, these activities. And that's often referred to as a sort of sec second agriculture mission there. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Another uh, another major outcome of that that ag mission was that Twitchell uh, got invitations for two Saudi princes to come visit uh, to come visit the United States, and in particular to take them to Arizona to learn about the farming methods and other things that were that were going on uh, in Arizona at the time. As again, a way to sort of sell this this wonderful expertise of uh, Arizona farmers. The first royal visit, there's a second one, the first royal visit in 1943 uh, was actually not very well covered in, in the media. I could find very, very few uh, stories about it. But essentially, the, the, the Saudi princes visited the Grand Canyon. They visited different agriculture sites. They visited some um, Navajo sheep farming operations. There were a few other miscellaneous activities that they did. But Carl Twitchell, again, I'm reading his documents, you see that he was massively disappointed about this particular visit, that he felt that there could have been so much more to it uh, that, that didn't necessarily materialize in that. Uh, so th this is, this is one, one visit, and it will get uh, improved the second visit. But before that happens, um, we have the Rogers mission. So David Rogers, uh, a farmer originally from Arizona, Skull Valley, Arizona, goes together with two of his high school friends. <laughs> Not, some of this stuff I, I find quite comical, uh, but in any case, they were also from Arizona. They had gone on into careers at uh, in, in soil science, uh, and, and they were accompanying him in this particular venture to go set up these farming operations in Al Kharj, uh, again from with the, with the sponsorship of the U.S. State Department. 
And at, the, at this particular site, uh, you have uh, you can see that the dark, the, the darkest uh, plots of land are marked as the American development. And this is where the, the activities of these farmers were really concentrated. So this was really starting in, in 19, the 1944, uh, but expanded a bit later. And as you can you can see some of these photographs, these are again the, the photographs of um, my predecessor at, at Syracuse, uh, George Cressy. And the, the, the image of just gorgeous green fields in, in the middle of the desert is really quite evocative. Uh, and, and this was something that was, that was treated as a sort of miracle of the American involvement in these farming operations. Uh, but of course, the, the, the big thing that, that was really important for the Saudis in this particular site is that there were these large limestone sinkholes, which is, where, which is what you have pictured um, in the bottom there. And so water was relatively easy to access. And this is why Al Kharj had become um, a favorite site of, of farming early on. Uh, but the Saudis were most interested in getting the American technology to help set that up. Uh, and so the, the Americans were largely responsible for importing different sorts of, of technology to uh, get the groundwater out of the ground. So the Rogers mission was was really quite favorably seen. Just a few this this wonderful quote from uh, from one of the uh, from one of the U.S. observers of the mission at the time. Uh, he sort of writes that these these workers had these these terrible primitive conditions, but they were nonetheless doing great credit to the U.S. image in Saudi Arabia. Um, and from the king on down, there was this great enthusiasm, uh, and it was a way to sort of demonstrate the American hands-on but scientific farming methods. Uh, and this was something that you often saw contrasted in these characterizations of, of Saudi farming at the time, that it was backwards, that, that there wasn't science involved in it, and they, they didn't really understand how that worked. Um, but there's also this constant reference to how the king loved these, uh, loved these farmers and were just really excited about them and these Americans of desert upbringing. And here you can also again see the way that the desert story is being sold as, as a form of expertise, uh, that the king treated them like sons, um, and that the success of this project spread far and wide. So this, this was largely framed, in, especially in the State Department archives. You can see that, that the people in Saudi Arabia were incredibly supportive of this particular project. Uh, but in the end, uh, after, after World War II ended, the US government stopped the funding for it. But it nonetheless sort of promoted this, this early vision of how it was that you could have uh, desert farming success. And much of that was, was concentrated in large sort of um, produce uh, produce developments, the, the watermelons were very famous. The king would bring people from Kuwait and other neighboring countries and say, look at my watermelons. Um, this, most, most of this produce, however, was just going to feed the royal family. There were thousands of them already at that point, and mostly living in Riyadh. Uh, so most of that produce was not going to, to the broader public. It was just going to, to the, the kings. Uh, there was one Dutch critic of this project that basically said the, you know, the Americans are just setting up this this authoritarian system back in back long long ago uh, that that this wasn't seen as a way of supporting local farmers. Um, in addition to the produce going to the royal family, you also had then the feed that was being grown there, alfalfa and other forage crops uh, that was largely being directed towards the king's horses. He kept uh, hundreds and hundreds of of uh, the, these beautiful horses on site. Later, then coming coming slowly back to uh, the the Saudi Al Marai story, uh, later cows got involved in this story. But before we get to the cows, I have to explain how it was and why it was that the Saudis were interested in, in cows. Because you know, many, many people often ask me about what kind of milk was being uh, drunk in, in, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, and basically, it was not cow milk, I can tell you that much. Uh, camel milk on occasion, uh, but really the, the interest in and, uh, cow milk production came quite a bit later. And 
for for the Saudi side, that really began with a second royal tour to Ari- to Arizona in 1947. So as I said, Twitchell was kind of upset about the way that the 1943 royal visit went, and he was still working with the State Department people trying to push them to uh, invest more in the Saudi relations and to do that again around desert agriculture. So in 1947, you have Crown Prince Saud al Saud uh, coming to Arizona, and this was much better covered in in the newspapers, and it was really held up as this, as this wonderful, spectacular event. Um, the Crown Prince, who later later becomes king as well, uh, he gets this this sort of uh, spectacular treatment, a grand tour around. Um, around Arizona, going to the Boulder Dam. Now now we know it as the Hoover Dam, uh, but really sort of showing the American engineering expertise and uh, how to, to develop a sort of modern miracle in, in the desert. Uh, so there are lots of pictures of the Saudis sort of traipsing through ditches and looking at des- different desert farming ex- uh, projects and also being wined and dined by the Phoenix notables. Uh, so this is at the Silver Spur restaurant in, uh, in Arizona. They stayed at one of the really famous uh, hotels in Arizona. Now, now it's kind of on the site of the Phoenician. If anybody has been to uh, to Phoenix, you know that place. Um, and what you see, I think, in this particular visit, this one is from Beltsville, um, which is in, in Maryland, not quite Arizona, but this broader um, this broader vision of trying to narrate this U.S.-Saudi partnership around agriculture, which is really quite different than we often uh, imagine and we hear about when we think about U.S. Gulf relations, often tied to um, tied to oil and uh, to to militarism. And what I, I think really comes out in these two men's smiles is this idea that, in fact, this is not necessarily a relationship that's built on force. Uh, it is also a, a kind of positive spectacle and a positive enlistment of of these interests uh, in, that, that often can, can get missed. So when Crown Prince Saud goes to Arizona. One of the things that he asks to see, are, well, he asks to see some uh, ranchers rope some cows and, and do all this sort of uh, display. But he was most impressed uh, on his visit by going to the dairy farms. And after he returned to Saudi Arabia, and he just some year, just a couple of years later, he became king of Saudi Arabia. He took over the farm. He took over Al Kharj. And the first one of one of the first things he does is ask to have a dairy actually established at Al Kharj. Uh, so it is really then with this this visit to Arizona that he said he decides no this is this is really what I want to do uh, here in in um, Saudi Arabia. And so this really is kick kick starts the uh, dairy production um, cow dairy production in Saudi Arabia. So now, in the interest of time, I kind of have to skip over a huge chunk of time to get us back to the story of how it is that we move from this early effort uh, in the 1950s to having Saudi Arabia being the home of the largest dairy company in the entire Middle East. Uh, So there's some smaller efforts to develop uh, farming there, but it's really then only with the 1970s that the Saudi government really starts to invest heavily in agriculture agriculture subsidies and trying to promote domestic agriculture. Uh, And and a big piece of that is subsidizing all these farmers. This concentrates power in the hands of of a smaller number of Saudi farmers and Saudi uh, elite families. And included in that are big dairy companies that that start to start to take hold and are benefiting massively from from these subsidy regimes. In the 1970s and, and into, uh, into about the early 1990s, Saudi quickly became one of the largest grain producers in the world, one of the largest wheat exporters in the world, uh, which again, for, for many of us who imagine the, the sort of dune landscapes of Saudi Arabia, this is quite astonishing. Uh, but as, as I think most, most of us know, and as you know from, from the case of Utah, if you put water on, <laughs> on these plants, they will grow, right? Uh, it's just a 
question of how long do you have the water to sustain that. Uh, so for Saudi, uh, this, this was something that they invested heavily in and really, really uh, required that water intensive production of forage and green fodder uh, in order to keep this dairy industry alive. So partly, yes, the, the, the mega dairies in Saudi Arabia are benefiting from those sort of state subsidies, which are more or less coming from oil, right? Uh, but they're also benefiting from this system of, uh, of investing the country's water in the grain production. This eventually is not going to be sustainable. Uh, and essentially, Saudi Arabia has depleted its groundwater reserves. Uh, and desalination is not really a, an efficient tool for, uh, for doing the kind of production that is needed to, to grow forage crops uh, for, for, such large, um, for such a large dairy industry. So Al Kharj, for example, today, uh, there's Almorai's operations have 94,000 cattle. Uh, that's that's a lot of that's a lot of feed that they are that they need. Um, so as a result of this depletion of the local resources, the Saudi government um, started to issue, I shall come, come back to this, issued a, a ban on domestic green production, uh, sorry, green fodder forage production, uh, and that ban went into effect in 2018. The government essentially shifted then the subsidy regimes from supporting local production of these agricultural products to subsidizing the foreign acquisition of land. Uh, and this is precisely what led the Saudis back to a place like Arizona in around 2015, when I said I first heard the story about the Saudis getting this large farm in uh, Vicksburg, Arizona. So with, with this, you have a, a, a mix of these sort of push and pull factors that led the Saudis back to Arizona, um, which include the ending of those subsidies, the lack of water resources. But on the other side, I think the Arizona side is really quite important here because this is where the, the sort of legal regime around water extraction becomes quite important. Um, so one of the, one of the imp important facts of the, the choice of the land where the Saudi farm is located is that they are outside of an active management area. So in Arizona, you have counties that are designated active management, active management areas and, and counties that are not. Active management essentially means that groundwater pumping is regulated. Outside of those AMAs, groundwater, is not, it's, it, groundwater pumping is not regulated. This has meant that where the Saudis are located, and, and it's on the, the other side here, uh, the Vicksburg farm, is outside of an AMA. That means that they can develop these new uh, hypermodern wells on site. These are lovely pictures from my brother's drone um, that, that you can uh, extract large amounts of water and nobody is monitoring this. So if you have the capital to develop these new wells, uh, you, can, you can dig really deep wells and you can do this in a high power efficient way. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what the Saudis have done when they've taken over this land. They have for I think it was 15 new well permits and, and got those approved by the state. Um, there's some other questionable things about how the Saudi uh, land deals have, have come about uh, that, that perhaps there's a little bit less information on because of uh, ongoing, ongoing investigations um, courtesy of finally Arizona's new Attorney General Chris Mays. So with this particular farm, as I said, this, this really became a, a politically sensitive issue in uh, 2022 around the election because of A.G. Mays' uh, effort to, to campaign around this issue, saying that this is unjust, this is not right, that the Saudis are coming in and extracting large amounts of, of water essentially for free. Uh, Katie Hobbs, the new governor of uh, Arizona, also attached uh, some, some of her campaigning to this particular issue. And I think this, this, it, it is important, in, in my view, as somebody from Arizona originally, to have these discussions. Uh, the, the one thing that I think is, is always important and what I've tried in a lot of the, the work that I've been doing in the last month speaking about this is that we need to be careful that we are not just assuming a sort of victim narrative, that it's these evil foreigners who are coming and taking our water, uh, that in fact it is the legal system that enables this kind of arrangement. Uh, and it is, of course, also that 
longer history of Arizona farmers going and setting up this entire farming operation and, and getting kickstarting uh, this interest in, uh, in Saudi Arabia many decades ago. So in, in that, though, I think we, we can look at some of these images, for example, of the, the immigration solicitors that, uh, that I showed before, but also this one wonderful map from 1928, sort of showing how, how Arizonans should be proud that their agricultural products are being shipped across the United States. This is a very narrowly defined territorial vision of where we should be proud that those products are being sent. Uh, and, and I think this is, this is another big issue with these mega dairies that are coming in and extracting large amounts of water in Arizona, they are also domestic. There are also a lot of large farms that are that are from outside of Arizona or just any farm for that matter uh, that, that is sending those products within the United States. And this is something that I think is quite important to, to keep in mind, especially as um, the Arizona legislature is now debating a, a bill to ban foreign ownership of farmland. Well, that again, still doesn't change the fact that these water codes uh, allow domestic companies to continue to, to have these unsustainable uh, practices. And in addition to that, I think to, to our, our wonderful land acknowledgement uh, that, that was read at the beginning of this talk, it is, of course, also a question of whose land are we talking about uh, and whose water are we talking about? Because this sort of broader project of colonizing Arizona and taking certain uh, indigenous groups' resources, which as my dear colleague uh, Andrew, Co Andrew Curley, a DNA geographer, has, has written, resources is just another word for colonialism that water resources being transformed into this sort of private property concept is something that uh, for, for him and others in the Navajo Nation, that they understand those water relations and those water laws are attached to particular colonial relations. And, and this is, of course, very important for us as we see what, what is happening with the, um, with the Supreme Court case in, in the, the next weeks and, and months, I suppose. So just to, to close then, just a, a few final points about maybe what I, what I think about as a, as a geographer about the sort of space-time of empire and thinking across space and time, uh, is that this, this idea of the U.S. Southwest and Arizona more specifically, but I think the U.S. Southwest more, more broadly, uh, is, is a kind of space for this um, settler project of, of transforming the desert into a kind of laboratory in which uh, the, the sort of colonial or commercial agricultural approach to the desert, to those resources, is then transformed into a form of, of expertise that can be marketed and, uh, and sold just as those agricultural products themselves can be. Uh, and it's this kind of techno-futuristic modernist approach to uh, to desert farming that is that is often built on these structures of extraction, which here again are are largely a, a, a hallmark of that colonial project. Uh, but beyond that, and I think this is this has been for for me one of the more interesting pieces as a scholar who tends to focus uh, my work internationally, is that this this is not just a project that has stayed in the U.S. Southwest. It's not that this is over. Uh, that in fact the the sort of connections between Arizona and the Arabian Peninsula are about these processes of connection and thinking linking space and time uh, across decades. And this this is something that. That is, that is not over or not past, but very much present. And this is something that I, I talk about in the book uh, based on, again, on another image from, uh, from my, my Syracuse predecessor, George Babcock Cressy. And he, he labels the, this is one of, one of the slides from, from that visit that he did to Al Kharj. He just labels this camel coke. Uh, this this is a, a sort of double exposure where it seems like it's a mistake, but for me, this is actually not a mistake. This is really the important way to, to see double when we're thinking about the past and the present. It is sometimes difficult for me to explain why we should be thinking about this sort of the, the, the problems of the Saudi farm deal in Arizona today as connected to this longer history from the 1940s. Uh, but, but for me, it, it absolutely is. And if we can see double, as with this double uh, exposure, we can start to see those colonial presence and think those together rather than in the sort of modernist, divided uh, approach to things. So with that, I thank you for, for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions.
We uh, uh, do have a few questions uh, on uh, Slido, and let me uh, mention that uh, information about uh, submitting uh, questions uh, through your phone device is available on the screen uh, and should be available both uh, in the auditorium but uh, to our virtual audience. Uh, first of all, let me uh, just answer one question. Uh, we're asked if the uh, lecture will be available to rewatch. Uh, and yes, uh, we will post this on the Stegner Center website in a matter of a couple of days. Uh, so uh, this is uh, available. Uh, <clears throat> you're asked uh, as far as a desert to desert uh, connection, it seems like uh, we're uh, most apt to import uh, bad habits uh, rather than lessons that reduce water use. Uh, are there lessons from Arizona or uh, Saudi Arabia that we should consider to help us uh, reduce uh, water use? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thank you. That, that's a, a wonderful question. Uh, there, there are a number of different uh, approaches and lessons. I think the, well, maybe, maybe also a, a, a lesson of a, a warning perhaps for, for the U.S. Southwest, is the Gulf experience with desalination. Uh, so there's been some talk about, well, we can just solve the water problems in California or Arizona or, or anywhere else if we just desalinate seawater. This is actually something that, that the Gulf uh, countries have been doing for years. Essentially, you couldn't build any cities in the Arabian Peninsula until you had desalination facilities being set up in the 1950s. Uh, and now most of this, almost all those cities are running on 98% desalinated seawater. Uh, this, this kind of works in a place that has essentially free oil and gas, right? Uh, this is not something that works in the context of, of the United States where there, there isn't access to cheap energy as such. Uh, so I've been working on Gulf sustainability initiatives and the sort of oil trend, post oil transition in the region for, for quite some time. And everybody keeps talking about getting the desal plants powered by solar. This would be really wonderful if they are able there to develop some of those technologies and to do that uh, at scale, because I think that's one of the big challenges is how to do get the solar power uh, to, to run these facilities at scale. So if that if that's successful, then that might be useful for, for the United States in the future. But of course, at, at present, uh, it's, it's maybe just a warning that we can't assume we can just desalinate our, pro our way out of the problem uh, because it's just so energy intensive that even the Gulf governments are not able to use desalinated seawater to grow um, agricultural products. Uh, beyond that, though, there's another way that you see some of these lessons being uh, transferred between uh, especially Oman, which I haven't really talked about here today, but Oman's uh, fallage system of water channeling and irrigation, which is actually really quite quite sophisticated. Uh, and there has been some connections uh, around this between Oman and Arizona, uh, but it's, it's more or less been mm, <laughs> ignored, shall I say. There, there's a much longer story about this in, in the, the book, uh, but there, there are some great lessons about sustainable living and dry farming, uh, but those often sort of get pushed to the side when it, it comes to be that, well, it's actually not really profit making uh, because it, it would move you away from a commercial agricultural system. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of the crux of the matter is that it's, it's the, these sorts of approaches are not about a commercial orientation. Uh, yeah, I think that leads into the next question. Uh, uh, one of your slides mentioned transforming the desert to a garden. Uh, this notion is prominent uh, here in Utah uh, also. Uh, and then the question is, how can we get societies to move away from uh, such thinking and begin to grapple with the realities of living in an arid place? Mm. Yeah, you know, I... Uh, because. Because I'm from Tucson, uh, I, on, on one level, I, I really understand the, the appeal of having a lush garden environment. I, I think my, my, my frustration as, as a child was always that my mother had me watering the plants. She wanted to have like this luxurious paradise in the backyard, and I would spend hours <laughs> watering the plants. And, and this, this, this frustrated me for various reasons, but I just I felt intensely the, the waste of that. But I could also understand why it appealed to her. Why I, it was so it was so nice to have that particular space. So on the emotional level, I understand it. Um, but I, I think if 
if we teach people and we learn to associate beauty with the desert uh, and those arid environments and we romanticize the beauty of the desert, I think that we can actually culturally communicate that in, in a way that uh, doesn't necessarily lead people to think that just these luxurious overflowing uh, green places like we imagine on the island of Hawaii, that this is not, uh, that this is not necessarily the, the, the paradigmatic image of beauty in, in our uh, landscapes. So for, for me, I, I really truly believe that the desert is beautiful and incredibly beautiful uh, in so many ways, whether it's just dunes or, or the, <laughs> the, the, this image here uh, of, of central Saudi Arabia. I find it absolutely astonishing. And, and if, if we can get people to, to value that, that can work through lots of different spaces, cultural spaces, film, literature, or just our day-to-day -day practices and doing zero scaping and other, other kinds of projects where we show that actually you can do a, a lot of beautiful work uh, in, in these desert landscapes. Um, and beyond that, educating people about the, the water demands that, that comes from this and the violence to the earth that is being done when, when we're applying water in places it shouldn't be. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, the next question is, uh, you mentioned the green forage ban. Uh, was that just uh, for new production or did it also uh, cover existing uh, farms as well? Yeah, so it, it covered um, it basically the, the entire country. So uh, I think the ban was announced in either 2014 or 15, and then it went into effect in 2018. So places that had these, these um, green forage operations in in place they had to phase it out they had a couple of years to phase it out and i think i think it was that it, this was exactly around the time that almarai started to go acquire that land uh in in arizona and and a few other places in california as well uh so it was with that shift in mind so they had a bit of a they had a bit of of time to to address it did the government provide some subsidy for the folks faced with the phase out? Or yes, not? yes, they did. And they, they uh, this is a simplification, but they essentially shifted the subsidies that were going to the production of domestic grain. They shifted those to subsidizing the same companies to acquire foreign farmland. Yeah. And, and this is this is something actually that was quite important because because those big agricultural families were were and are powerful elites within the system. I'm largely a scholar of authoritarianism. When you when you know how these regimes work, you need to have allies, and you need to make sure you don't uh, just completely cut off your allies. And so that that was an important part of of just shifting those subsidy regimes, so that they they made sure that they didn't lose the allies that were supporting the the regime. And that feeds into the next question, uh, which is uh, to what extent is the uh, produce from Al Karaj uh, still grown for the benefit of the royal family alone or is it grown more broadly oh that's 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 a good question I mean I, I think the the produce isn't directly the, any of the, the sort of agricultural production that is happening there isn't necessarily directly going to royal family members today just because the the ownership of of all of those farms and the, and the, the the territories there has been the the distribution has shifted. However, you have uh, across across Saudi Arabia and across the Gulf countries this very interesting dynamic where you have pri private companies that are largely state owned, or they have a large share of ownership of uh, from from the government. So, for Al Marai, for example, twenty two percent of its ownership is government and quasi government entities. So, the, this this I would say is pretty characteristic characteristic of most of the of the Saudi agriculture sector where if it's not a uh, majority shareholder government it could be partially it, it's a mix of things so in in some way uh, the profits of that produce are going back to the Saudis because I mean as I said with with Amarai being the the largest dairy company in in the Middle East they are selling their milk and other dairy products and other other products uh, all over the Middle East. So th there again, it's not necessarily just the, the produce or the, the, the products, but the profits that are getting distributed back to the, back to the ruling families. OK, interesting. Uh, have you come across uh, examples of the US government extracting or selling arid lands knowledge in regions outside uh, the Arabian Peninsula? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there's there's quite a lot of connections uh, with uh, with Israel Palestine, uh, which which I kept pretty uh, pretty carefully outside of this region. You see a fair bit as well in Jordan, I think. Um, if, if, it, if we're asking specifically about arid lands expertise, maybe a bit also in Latin America, but I would say most of this is concentrated in, in the Middle East region. Uh, Egypt as well has had, a, there, there's a long, <clears throat> a long history of connection between Arizona researchers and in Egypt, uh, where, where some of this has, has happened, but it's, it's a little bit patchy. I, I think for, for the purposes of this project, I kept myself very focused on, um, uh, on the Arabian Peninsula and Arizona, even though I was always reading about the overflows in, in these other spaces as well. And, and hopefully when I, I continue the, the next phases of this research, I will broaden that out. Uh, let me ask, uh, I, I couldn't help but uh, think about uh, connections between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia uh, through World War II and then carrying on into the latter part of the 20th century uh, in the area of uh, uh, energy, oil. Uh, are there any, any parallels uh, uh, between the agricultural sector and uh, the oil sector uh, mm -hmm. that uh, you, you can enlighten us on or draw yeah. any uh, you know connections with uh, absolutely I wouldn't I, I would say it's actually more than just parallels they're they're direct connections um, so th there, there's lots of ways that you see this across across the Arabian Peninsula maybe not just in Saudi but in the UAE and Oman as well uh, especially with the early the, the efforts to do the early geology and exploration for oil reserves uh, often these were framed as uh, explorations for water but they were searching mostly for oil. Uh, so a, a lot of that early sort of scientific research on the, the geology and the distribution of, of resources in, in Saudi and, and beyond uh, was connected to that and setting up those, those relationships. Uh, that, so that, that was one piece of it, but also with the Al Kharj farm. In the late 1930s, they were the first uh, uh, Saudi Aramco, or what we now know as Saudi Aramco, then just Aramco, the uh, um, uh, Arabian American oil company. Their first, they were the ones that were first put in charge of the Al Kharj farm. So then when Twitchell came in and got the State Department to, to fund the, the Arizona farmers to go there, they took that out of the hands of Aramco, the oil company. And then when the American, when the American um, State Department farmers left, it went back to Saudi Aramco. Uh, so Saudi Aramco was, was running this farm until the late, late 1950s, early 1960s. I can't remember exactly when they closed down, uh, but, but Aramco was, they, they hired a farmer from Texas. They hired lots of others uh, to come and, and maintain this particular operation. Uh, and, and like the story that Twitchell was telling the U.S. State Department, this, this, was, the, this was the story that, this, that Aramco was getting as well is that in order to make sure you have good graces, Aramco sponsored plenty of other projects that we might now understand as CSR. Um, they were doing lots of these projects uh, and, and the farming was one big piece of that to make sure they stay in good graces with the leadership. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was absolutely connected, whether it was for the, the scientific exploration or actually maintaining those water and farming networks. Okay. Uh, another question sort of ties in with that, uh, uh, that you, you mentioned that uh, the U.S.-Saudi relationship is often seen through the lens of oil and militarism, uh, not ag. Uh, but if the uh, State Department's interest in uh, airfields was motivating the engagement uh, with ag, uh, doesn't uh, even ag ultimately come back to foreign policy and uh, military connections, etc.? Yeah, it, it does. And I think that this is this is something I, I've I've been trying to think about more broadly as well, because I um, I, I completely agree more than anything. Maybe it, it shows us a, a different way to view the interconnection between these relationships, that it is maybe not just about the military, but for the military to actually gain that that set of connections and those relationships. 
it works through other networks as well to, to give it hold, uh, that, that it, it becomes stickier in a sense because of that. Uh, but, but I've certainly seen this also with my, my work in Oman, uh, which again, I haven't really talked about here, but there's this big University of Arizona um, uh, date farming operation that, that was approved by the Omani government in 2018. Uh, the, the millions of dollars that the U University of Arizona was getting for this date project was a military offset. So essentially, when when so some of the Gulf governments, including Oman, have a, a requirement that if you have a big arms deal, there has to be a certain percentage of that arms deal that is invested locally in certain projects. And so through these this mechanism, the team of researchers at the University of Arizona was able to ensure that that arms deal between Oma, the Omani government and Lockheed Martin, uh, the, the millions of dollars from that offset were going to the University of Arizona to set up the State Palm Project in Oman. So it's supposed to be about investing locally, but it's going to US actors who are implementing it. So you have lots of things like this as well, where it's military money, it's military connections, but it's getting enacted and working through some of these other channels. Uh, and I think this is, again, sort of helping us to see the stickiness of it, that it is not just about the, the, the planes themselves, but it has this way that it touches down in, in other spaces. <clears throat> Fascinating. <laughs> uh, you mentioned some proposed legislation in Arizona regarding uh, uh, foreign uh, ag owners. Uh, are the Saudis uh, included in that or are they uh, ex exempted? Uh, and is this a reflection of uh, continued Saudi influence in Arizona? Yeah, so the the legislation in, in Arizona that's currently being debated, it's it's still in flux, uh, but at present, the way that the bill reads, it includes, it, it explicitly names the Saudis. Uh, and it also, the, the last we, we looked at, it also includes... Uh, foreign countries, companies, and their subsidiaries. Uh, so I had a meeting with, with uh, the Attorney General a couple of weeks ago, and this is something that I really was trying to emphasize, that uh, both with the Saudis and the Emiratis, the Emiratis have a farm next door that nobody's talking about, <laughs> uh, they, they both use US-based subsidiaries. Uh, so if the legislation doesn't necessarily account for the subsidiaries, then yeah, that, that doesn't necessarily change anything. My reading on it, though, is that it's, it's a way to make it look like you're doing something without actually changing the fundamental problem, which is Arizona's legal system of having groundwater pumping being unregulated outside of these active management areas. Um, so it's it, it's great. It's it's all it's um, it's it's wonderful for the people that want to make that a particular political story that they can say, look, we've done something, uh, but it doesn't necessarily fundamentally change the situation. And that leads to the next and next to the last question. Uh, how much has the groundwater level in Arizona been reduced? Uh, that's that's also hard to evaluate because there is not proper monitoring of this. Uh, so I, I couldn't give any numbers. I think in, in different parts of the state there are some estimates, but around the uh, around the farm where the the Saudi operation is, there's communities, I mean, the, the church next door to the farm, its wells are dry now. Um, the, the other far farmers are now experiencing their water levels low, but there isn't a, a systematic mapping of that. And so we really don't know. This is, this is again, the, the, the fundamental challenge with Arizona's water laws is that there isn't, there's no regulation on this. It's only in the active management areas that there's any kind of monitoring of that data. Okay. Uh, and then a uh, final question, uh, could you say more about the uh, opportunity, uh, your quote, opportunity to see double? Hmm. Uh, our questioner was thinking about uh, not only a narrative about globalized capital, but also a narrative of uh, relationships uh, between humans, hmm. uh, the king loving uh, Arizona folks uh, like sons, hmm. et cetera. Hmm. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, I think we, Maybe, maybe I'll just start with, I am a person who likes order. <laughs> I like clear order. I, I like to, to understand things go in this category or this category. And it's very difficult, I think, for, for some of us to, to, to who are 
who grow up in the system of thinking through modernist order, uh, that, that there can be those conflicting feelings. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, family relationships, for example, are a great example of this. Sometimes you are very frustrated and you have uh, anger with your family members, but you still love them. Right. Uh, so I, I think that that sort of tension of multiple feelings, multiple sorts of connections uh, with with relationships, as, as the, the questioner is asking about, are really quite important. And also then understanding how to even address this issue with the Saudi farm in Arizona, where for me, I, I've. I've been pleased in some sense to a lot of the reporters that I've spoken with have questioned, you know, is this just a case of Orientalism? We're just treating the Saudis as, as a kind of whipping boy here. That's, I, I get that and I'm happy that they're asking that. And I, I agree that yes, there, there is a lot of xenophobia that is being written into this, but at the same time, it is important to talk about these questions of water extraction and the, the legal frameworks in, in Arizona that need to be challenged. Um, so I think if we can if we can hold together those sorts of mix of, of relations, then you might be able to move toward a, a direction that is more more just and and also might include, for example, the the Navajo and other indigenous groups who are also being harmed by these policies. So there, there's a kind of openness that comes with seeing uh, through through multiplicity and seeing double. Well, you have uh, uh, certainly got us uh, seeing double uh, between uh, Arizona and Saudi Arabia, uh, and we thank you for that. Uh, let me uh, conclude uh, by just uh, reminding folks that uh, Thursday uh, a week uh, from this week, on April 6th, uh, the Stegner Center will host Professor Andrew Gulliford, uh, who will speak on his book, uh, Bears Ears, A Landscape of Refuge and Resistance. Uh, and uh, let us uh, conclude uh, by uh, thanking uh, Professor uh, Natalie Koch uh, for uh, the presentation today. And uh, we very much appreciate uh, everyone joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.